good morning. It's good to be here and to be with you. I'm Derek Wilmot, and I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Clemson's Worship Associate Team. Each week, this community comes together to participate in worship, music, and reflection. This is where we seek to have our hearts opened and our imaginations fired. This is the place that reminds us that we're deeply connected to one another and all living things. Even though our building is closed, we gather together for weekly online worship at 1130 on Sunday mornings. We also gather for social connection and the sharing of joys and concerns in our Zoom meeting. Please join us. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. This fellowship is a religious community grounded in the heritage and principles of Unitarian Universalism. We seek to create a loving community, inspire joy and spiritual growth, and support courageous action. All are welcome, regardless of religious background, political persuasion, ethnicity, age, ability, sexual orientation, or gender, gender identity, or expression. If you have a desire to explore questions of truth and meaning and are respectful of our diversity of people and beliefs, you have found kindred spirits here. If you'd like more information about the fellowship or Unitarian Universalism, please see information about us on our website, uufc.org. If you're interested in getting our weekly newsletter so you can get connected to our community for online social events, our weekly sharing of joys and concerns, and our collective efforts to support local social justice work, please reach out to the office by the email or on our website. You can also find us on Facebook. So let us begin worship with these opening words. The Bright Thread of Hope by Gretchen Haley. There's too much beauty in this world to give up on it. And yet, uh, and it is always too soon to surrender to cynicism. Bring your doubt, your skepticism, your downright confusion, even your bitterness. But in the midst of all these in the center, wrap your tender fingers around that still bright thread of hope. Feel in your heart that still ready hunger for something more. Our vision, we glimpse every day in the rising sun. Across the foothills, the light that spreads across the face of the one we love. The look of knowing all there is to know and still loving life. Loving us, just as it is, just as we are. For this hour, we come to celebrate, to praise, to give thanks, to refuse to give up, to, to steady ourselves. Keepers of hope, brave builders of this still possible world. Come. Let us worship together. There is more hope somewhere. 
Good job. We gather together in a spirit of love, with justice as our guide. This is our chosen covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth with freedom, and to care for one another. Hello, my name is Reverend Christina Branham Martin, and I'm the interim minister here at the Fellowship. What a great day to be together. I want to let you know of just a few things happening today. At noon, Today, June 13th, we have a congregational meeting. It is online, and the link to that was sent to the members of the fellowship through an email, if you could look for that and join us. We've got something to vote on. We have information to share about the interim ministry period. We have uh, some small reports. And most importantly, we have an opportunity to ask questions about our re-entry for the fall, our time to come back together. Thank you. All different now. Juneteenth, the first day of freedom. By Angela Johnson, illustrated by E.B. Lewis. A June morning breeze off the port blew the smell of honeysuckle past the fields, across the yard, and into our room to wake us. And nobody knew, as we ate a little, talked a little, and headed to the fields as the sun was rising, that soon, it would all be different. Then we worked and worked and worked some more under the hot Texas sun until word spread from the port to town, through the countryside and into the fields that a Union general had read from a balcony that we were all now and forever free and things would be all different now. I watched as my Aunt Laura sang as she held her baby. Mr. Jake, who some say was a hundred, cried quietly. And a group of grown people bowed their heads and whispered things that I could not hear. My mama held my hand softly and looked beyond as another breeze blew over and everything fell to a hush. But later... Papa, Mama, the aunts and uncles, and all of my cousins had an afternoon picnic by the water. My baby brother crawled around on our blanket as we listened to the sound of the waves. And as more people joined us, we ate as a free people, laughed as a free people, and told stories as free people on into the night. What was before would be no more. As we walked back home, the cool of the night soothed our tired feet that padded quietly past the shadowy fields of cotton. And in the morning, the smell of honeysuckle will wake me again beside my sisters and brother to a time that will be, for all of us, all different now. At this time, we light candles for joys and concerns shared in our community. The first that are light is one of sorrow, of concern for those who are amongst us who are grieving the loss of a family member and a friend. Yet together in community, we hold them and help them celebrate the person they loved through memory. This next candlelight light is for joy. It's for grandparents who are celebrating a graduation of a grandchild with honors and the moving of that grandchild onto college. Yes, this is definitely a joy. And the next candle I light is in honor of our five new members. They are joining together for our membership workshop this afternoon. And the last that I light was for all the joys and concerns that are held silently in our hearts at this time. 
Let us know how we can help you at this time. Wake now my senses and hear the earth call. Feel the deep power of being in all. Keep with the web of creation your vow. Giving, receiving as love shows us how. Wake now, my reason, reach out to the new. Join with each pilgrim who quests for the true. Honor the beauty and wisdom of time. Suffer thy limit and praise the sublime. Wake now, compassion, give heed to the cry. Voices of suffering fill the wide sky. Take as your neighbor, both stranger and friend, praying and striving their hardship to end. Wake now, my conscience, with justice thy guide. Join with all people whose rights are denied. Take not for granted a privileged place. God's love embraces the whole human race. Wake now, my vision of ministry clear. Brighten my pathway with radiance here. Mingle my calling with all who will share. Work toward a planet transformed by our care. The hymn we just heard, Wake Now My Senses, has always been a favorite of mine. It, I think it encapsulates what's important about Unitarian Universalism. It calls for us to be mindful of our senses, along with our reason and our compassion and our conscience. And it holds that each are equally important for creating our vision of a planet transformed by our care. But what happens when our vision falls short of real change? What does our common faith offer us as we try to keep hope alive during that time? Perhaps you've asked yourself these questions at one time or another as a Unitarian Universalist. During the last few years, I have searched my personal faith for answers to these questions, and I'd like to share the story of that journey today with you. It is June, and an anniversary of utmost importance is coming up. We all know that freedom has been proclaimed in this country many times, such as on June 19th, 1865, two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, this day called Juneteenth is the celebration of the day when the last slaves in the U.S. were freed. Juneteenth marked the beginning of a new era of promised freedom and equality in the United States. And it happened in Galveston, Texas. And for that, Galveston, Texas is hallowed ground for freedom. I was raised in Houston, Texas, and Galveston was only a 45-minute drive just south. It was a small island with beaches running along it. And I remember traveling there, and I have a vivid memory of learning 
that I was standing on the ground where the proclamation was read so long ago. This ground was a place for celebrating freedom and for me, a child, a white child. It was a place to remind me that the history of this country included slavery. I felt both pride for being there and sorrow for being in this place. It was the first time I remember as a young child experiencing the juxtaposition of these emotions in my identity as an American. And it was the beginning of the path that has led me to traverse the history of racism and injustice in this country and to seek a means for change. I grew up in the aftermath of the civil rights movement, yet I was influenced by the activism it inspired. I was an independent child empowered by the women's movement too. And at the age of 15, I attended the Unitarian Universalist United Nations Office Conference. That year, the theme was on nuclear disarmament. It inspired my view of democracy and a sense of urgency that each one of us is responsible for what we need to do. Also, the GLBTQ movement informed me of how sexual oppression affected the rights of all of us. As a young adult, I established a relationship with a local nonprofit called the Center for the Healing of Racism. There, I was in dialogue with others who were trying to understand racism and how it had been woven into the fiber of American society and into the structure of knowing ourselves and our place in this culture. My upbringing, my upbringing as a Unitarian Universalist led me to truly believe that we could make a difference if only we tried hard enough, marched enough, and wrote letters enough. But is it enough? I've been asking myself this. In 1967, MLK Jr. wrote, a true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our past and present policies. We are called to play the good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will only be the initial act. One day, we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not constantly be beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than just flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. Close quote. A good friend shared with me that these words have been a model for how he has lived his life. He explained that King isn't just talking about tiny changes here, tinkering, a march every once in a while, letter writing. He is talking about figuring out what the structure is and restructuring it. So the first question we ask is what is the structure? And the second is how do we replace it? And the third is what is my role in this process? He is talking about destroying the structures of white supremacy that enslave people, not just here, but everywhere in all aspects of the structure. Through our Unitarian Universalist principles, we have made a commitment to honor the inherent worth and dignity of all people. And we have made a commitment to be aware of our connection to each other and to all of existence. These personal principles and purposes act as a foundation for the sacred paths we each live out on a daily basis. And our task collectively 
is to join together in this journey towards a society that supports our principles and our purposes. Can we bring about a true revolution of values? There have been times when I've wondered, one of which was in the spring of the first year of seminary. I was traveling through the Deep South with fellow seminarians and Unitarian Universalist colleagues. We were studying the history of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 60s in the Deep South. And on this trip, we visited places of tragedy. And we visited places of triumph. Again, like in Galveston, Texas, I stood on the ground of those sacred places in search of truth. Truth about the fact that once again, we had to fight for the promise of freedom and equality in this United States of America. Throughout the South, we drove through towns that had an invisible line that separated the areas of commerce and prosperity from poverty and despair. Not surprisingly, this was the color line. And in many town squares, the markers honoring the Confederate soldiers stood for their just and holy cause. Some have come down, but many remain. While these remain, the headstones of the civil rights movement martyrs stood decorated, desecrated with shotgun fire and were held upright only by steel braces. Brought tears to my eyes to see that. On the anniversary of the momentous march from Selma to Montgomery, we gathered together on this trip and we proudly crossed as a group hand in hand on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Our celebration ended sadly as young teenagers real yelled racial slurs at us as they drove by. After these experiences and for a long time afterward, I grieved the loss of my idealism. For on this trip and in these moments, I had lost my belief that I could really effectively bring it about change. I had also lost an important element of my faith, a belief that we could join together in the sacred work of living out our principles and purposes, and by doing so, bring about a transformed world. I simply had lost my hope. Leroy Jones, an African-American poet, writes that hope is a delicate suffering. Reverend Rebecca Parker writes in her book, Blessing the World, that Unitarian Universalism doesn't offer pat theological answers. She says, when our current faith is inadequate to deliver us from or even explain our reality, we have three options. The first is we can reject our faith. We can deny our experience or we can become theologians. Wrestling with tradition and experience until we discover a new life-giving faith. Theology is no longer just an academic exercise. It is the endeavor itself of trying to repair what is broken. Theology then takes salvation in not only as its subject, but as its task. So with this all in mind, I sought out others to help repair what was broken in my heart. I needed to find hope again. I visited the Holocaust Museum in the city in which I lived. They arranged for me to speak with a survivor of the Holocaust who was a docent there, an elderly woman with the sweetest smile. I asked her, how have you overcome your brokenness? How did you find hope? She answered that each day she gave thanks for the simple things. 
Each day she found strength in community. And each day, no matter what, she vowed to reach out to others one by one every day to fight hatred in all of its forms. She said this was her life's work. I also reached out to my allies at the Center for the Healing of Racism and they reminded me that each day we must celebrate where we see love triumph in all of its small achievements. Like the teaching of Gandhi, they urge me to remember that we are striving to become the change we want to see. I found strength in an essay written by Reverend Parker where she said that the source of wisdom that can help us rebuild the world on a foundation of love and justice is those who have borne the brunt of violence and oppression. We must find religious value in discovering their truths. Their truths resound in the fact that racism is more than individual acts of ill will. Racism is a systemic imbalance of power that extends beyond the gulf simply between African Americans and European Americans. It extends to all people of color. It extends to Latinx Americans demanding respect for their place in our country and in our economy. It extends to Arab Americans wanting others to not see them and their children as terrorists. It extends to Asian Americans who have fought stereotypes for so long and recent hatred. Racism is passed on simply through the perpetuating cycle of teaching a young child that they are better than another. So on my trip in seminary through the Deep South, I bought some books for my daughter. She was five years old at the time, and one book in particular about Ruby Bridges, who at the age of six, almost the same age as my daughter, was the first to attend a segregated school during the Civil Rights Movement. It told of the differences that she saw in each other and in the water fountains and in the schools and in the libraries that divided them. And I wondered when I should share the harsh reality of the history of this country with her. Would she understand? Should I wait till she is older? These are the questions you ask as a parent of a white child. I decided to read it to her because I believed that the issues of racism were already a part of her life outside of the shelter of our home. I believe that she should know that in 1960, her best friend would have been separated from her based on the color of their skin. After reading her the book about Ruby Bridges, she said to me, Mommy, they changed the laws because they were wrong. She understood. So I stand here now at this pulpit, again on sacred ground, to speak the truth, to declare my faith, and to share my hope and the energy of action. My journey has brought me back my hope. The truth is that we must be fully present to the reality that our work for true freedom and justice is not done. My faith has been renewed by the grace that we extend to each other in the times of brokenness and despair. And in community, we can offer a safe place to fall when we are broken. For as Pema Chodron, the American Buddhist nun writes, only the heart that has been broken open can contain the world. My hope. My hope is grounded in my belief that if each of us impacts at least one child as a parent, a teacher, a neighbor, or a friend, then together we can raise a generation of children who believe that the revolution of values is possible and that we can give them the tools to make it so. 
May we light the spark of justice in their hearts. Our liberal religion is a foundation for working towards a revolution of values. For liberal religion is not a head trip, writes Rebecca Parker. Its values and principles are not something dreamed up by an armchair philosopher who thinks that these things might be good to believe. The principles of tolerance and faith and reason and freedom are principles articulated by those who have touched and who have been touched by life. To be committed to these principles is to follow a path that leads me into deep intimacy with those things of abiding beauty and power that are holy, a path that simply leads to love. Choose to Bless the World by Rev. Rebecca Parker Your gifts, whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting, any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, Obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. The choice to bless the world is more than an act of will, a moving forward into the world with an intention to do good. It is an act of recognition, a confession of surprise, a grateful acknowledgement that in the midst of a broken world, unspeakable beauty, grace, and mystery abide. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life, even yours. And while there is injustice, anesthetization, or evil, there moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. The choice to bless the world can take you into solitude to search for the sources of power and grace, native wisdom, healing, and liberation. More, the choice will draw you into community, the endeavor shared, the heritage passed on, the companionship of struggle, the importance of keeping faith, the life of ritual and praise, the comfort of human friendship, the company of earth, the chorus of life welcoming you. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. We've come to the end of our service. As you extinguish your flame at home and I extinguish this here, 
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Go in peace, my friends. <laughs>